I think we all need to be worried about it. I can certainly say at Schwab, we, we take this very seriously in terms of what we're doing inside our own organization and with our systems, as I'm sure every other financial institution right. is. But I think there's, I have no greater ability than anybody else to speculate on if it happens and when and how big it is. But I think there's a couple of factors to consider to the point made by the guests this morning, whose soundbite we just heard, it does represent potentially something systemic that really kind of moves into the entire global financial system. But maybe just as important would be what it would do to psychology. And if you think back to 2008, yes, there were plenty of, of fundamental and bubble bursting reasons why we had the carnage that we did, why the market went down as much as it did, why the recession was as ugly as it was. But a lot of it was pure fear on the part of businesses and consumers and investors. And that can feed on itself too. And versus something, say, like a natural disaster that isn't necessarily going to instill that pervasive fear, right. I think a cyber attack would. You know, Michael, to some degree, we all get lulled into a false sense of security about all of this because there are plenty of uh, security services out there that uh, are designed or their, their mission is to, to, to prevent this from happening, but then it happens. So, you know, are we sure. really that uh, safe uh, from that kind of an attack? No, Bill, but we never really are, and we haven't been for the past few years. When I think back to 2007, uh, you know, we were talking about subprime, and we, we were saying, all right, we understand how subprime could be a threat. We didn't know that the banks were levered 40 to 1. Uh, most of us didn't know. We didn't know that there were $2 billion, $3 billion of, dollars of off balance sheet sieves. I didn't know what a sieve was, Bill, until all of a sudden you're sitting at your desk in the fall with the market dropping and overnight funds not trading, trying to say, now, what is it and what did it just do and how? So my point here is I, I actually think the earlier guest was a bit of an optimist by saying that this is the one remaining threat. It's not the one. We've got North Korea. We've got Iran. We've got a, a nuke that could go. And cybersecurity is big. But we have to, I think, look at the fundamentals underlying the economy and where we are. And, you know, it's been a long time since we had a recession. Something rather unexpected over the next few years will likely trigger another one. Investors shouldn't be surprised, but we will be. Yeah. But, but going back to the element of fear, Lizanne, I mean, when you think about a cyber attack on the financial systems, I mean, think about that J.P. Morgan note, the great liquidity crisis, highlighting the fact that there are so many electronic trading desks, that there are so many products, um, so many assets in, in passive vehicles, and that when volatility spikes, there could be an absence of liquidity. Multiply that by the impact a cyber attack could have on a party with the rest of the market still trading, and we could see a flash crash times 10, I would think. I mean, if, if there was something that prevented liquidity from coming into the market. Sure, sure we could. I, I think that there, there are important differences in terms of the structure of the global financial system, the interconnected nature of it, the, the, the sort of capital cushion that banks had, uh, the leverage that global financial institutions had versus today. That's not to dismiss and say nothing to see here if we had a cyber attack that was global in nature. I still think it would be a serious issue, but there are some not just backstops in terms of market functionality, but a, a, a background environment a, around the global financial system that is different and arguably at least marginally healthier than what we had leading into the global financial crisis.